In Back to the Future, Doc Brown was really excited about Marty's camcorder from 1985, but uh, that camcorder is looking just a bit outdated these days. So just imagine what Doc would have thought had he seen a smartphone, which has pretty much taken the place of the camcorder for day-to-day -day video recording. However, we didn't make that transition overnight. In fact, I want to show you an interesting little forgotten piece of camcorder history. And um, I've had this device in my possession for about 13 years, or since around about 2006. And to understand why it's such an interesting piece of technology, I need to kind of set uh, the time period for you. If you look at a rough timeline, in the year 1980, people were still using Super 8 film cameras to record motion video. It wasn't until around 1983 that camcorders like the one Marty used in Back to the Future actually appeared on the market, which is crazy to think that was just two years prior to when the movie came out. By 1990, we were still using these sort of cameras, although not for long. Uh, by 2000, camcorders had shrunk a lot and were using a variety of different cassette formats, with uh, Mini DV being the most common on the high end. And then 10 years later in 2010, we were using memory card based camcorders. And finally a decade later, the smartphone has more or less killed off most other still cameras and camcorders because everyone has one in their pocket and the video quality is good enough for most consumers. But I want to focus on a little slice of time right around 2005. So realistically speaking, if you wanted to record video during this time, uh, you could go for a regular mini DV camcorder. Uh, for those that are too young to remember, these recorded to little cassette tapes, but uh, the information was stored digitally and the quality was generally pretty good. You could also get a camcorder that recorded to DVD. Now, both of these products produced video that was pretty good quality, but uh, was also generally expensive and bulky to carry around with you. Uh, thus, they were used mostly for special occasions. Many digital cameras of the time also had the ability to record small video clips. Uh, the trouble is they were often very low resolution, slow frame rate, limited to usually around 15 to 30 second clips, and uh, often didn't even include audio. And, uh, these are some clips I personally took on various such cameras back in the day. Most cell phones of the era also included cameras and a few even had the ability to record short, low resolution video clips. And remember, there were no smartphones on the market at this point, at least not any that would resemble ones that we use today. And another option was a USB webcam attached to a laptop computer or something. However, from around 2005 to 2008, there were a variety of no-name brands that introduced um, a variety of little cheap uh, devices like this that could be used as camcorders. Aptech was one of the leading companies in this regard. It may be pronounced Aptech, as I've never heard it pronounced by anyone else. Um, Aptech stands for Affordable Innovative Personal Technology. Now, whether that's an acronym or a backronym, I don't know. Um, anyway, they produced a variety of little camcorder type devices, and I have one of them here, uh, which is the ISDV2 model, which uh, came out for the Christmas season of 2006. And while the website and the company itself seems to be long gone, you can still check out the website using the Wayback Machine. Uh, so you can see that the ISDV2 model was selling for $129 at the time, uh, but if you fast forward to the next year, you'll see the price had dropped to $89. And I believe I paid $69 for mine sometime around that time. So let's have a closer look at this one. Uh, mine is a little beat up because it's all quite a bit of use uh, for a couple of years. Uh, so it actually runs on a couple of AA batteries, and um, we'll need an SD card, and believe it or not, the largest card it can handle is a 2 gigabyte card, and uh, that's the smallest one I could find around the house, so <laughs> that worked out just perfect. Um, I'll go ahead and insert that here. Now uh, let's open up the screen and have a look. The screen is smaller than you would probably think watching this video. It's actually about the size of a postage stamp. In fact, I highly suspect they used an off-the-shelf screen that was common at the time on the outside part of flip-style cellular phones like this. I also think they used an off-the-shelf CMOS imager from a webcam at the time. So let's have a brief overview of the main menu. Uh, in here you can set the resolution, self-timer, and a whole bunch of other features you wouldn't expect to see on a toy camera. And while it does have white balance settings, you can't do a custom, you have to use one of the presets. It also has a video light, uh, which has a couple of LEDs in the front. They aren't super bright, but uh, they're good enough to illuminate objects that are only a few feet from the camera. On the mode screen, you have a camera mode, obviously, and then playback mode, and then MP3. <laughs> yep, this also doubled as an MP3 player, albeit uh, not a very good one. Uh, it also was a voice recorder, but I should also say not a very good one. 
And uh, then in here you have the settings where you can configure things like NTSC or PAL, uh, format an SD card, etc. And in playback mode you can see some of the video clips I've taken and, uh, and watch those. OK, uh, so let's mount this thing to a tripod, another feature I might add that uh, a lot of toy cameras uh, lacked at the time. OK, and so this is some video directly from the little camera. Now, I wanted to give you like a comparison with something you're familiar with or used to seeing, which is the studio. I mean, I show it in every video. So I thought this would be something interesting to show. Um, now, keep in mind, of course, it's 4 by 3 aspect ratio, so it's it's not going to fill the widescreen format that YouTube uh, wants to have these days. Also, you're hearing the audio from my overhead microphone, which is what you always hear in my videos. But just for the heck of it, I thought I'd let you hear uh, what the audio sounds like from the camera itself, keeping in mind the camera is about six or seven feet away from me. Um, and to be fair, you don't normally hear the audio from my regular camera either because, again, uh, you're always hearing it from above. But anyway, um, let's take the camera out around town and see if we can find something interesting to, to take video of. I took the camera down to our local Kennedale Town Center to have a look at the clock tower and all of the colorful flowers underneath. And here's our September 11th memorial, which uh, has an original piece of one of the Twin Towers along with the monument showing the names of all the people that died. Now, while the video quality is questionable, even by the standards of 2005, it can also take still photos, and honestly, they aren't bad. Um, as a still camera, it was actually pretty decent for the money and was much better than cell phone cameras of the time. In fact, using the macro mode, I took this photo of my daughter back in 2007, and uh, the depth of field makes it look like a pretty fancy camera. Looking at some other old footage, I took this video of me washing my car back then. So yeah, that's uh, what I was driving in 2007. That's actually a 1995 model Eagle Talon, and it was already 12 years old at the time, but I took good care of it. Um, I'm sure it's in a junkyard or been recycled by now though. So uh, looking at these files, you'll see the videos are stored in the old Microsoft ASF format. Uh, fortunately, VLC player will play these, and I wanted to take a look at the media information and see what we can find out. So let's click on codec details. So it is an MPEG-4 video stream, and it is 640 by 480 which is what it's supposed to be. It says 30 frames per second, but I have my doubts about this, which we'll look into later. And the audio is mono and 11 kilohertz sample rate, which partially explains why it sounds so bad. Anyway, I can't even import these videos into Final Cut Pro, so I have to use a program like this first to convert them over to something more modern. So uh, let's take a look at this in Final Cut Pro. I'm zoomed in right now to the point that you can see single frames. So if you look where my mouse is, you'll see these little gray boxes that light up and that's an individual frame. So uh, let's go to the beginning of this clip. OK, so new frame and look here. Uh, these two frames are identical. So uh, new frame, new frame, new frame, new frame and here we go again, identical frames. So by my estimation, it really does about 24 frames per second. And it actually gets much worse in dark environments because it leaves the shutter open longer. I also wanted to see if their claims of megapixels was accurate. You see, it was advertised as a 6 megapixel camera, which to be honest was quite a claim to make back in 2005, even for a professional product. But uh, looking at the specifications in the manual, you may notice here that it says sensor effective resolution is 3 megapixels, and interpolated resolution is 6 megapixels. Now, what does this mean? Well, this was a common deceptive practice back at that time, uh, particularly for no-name brands. And that is, they would put a substandard uh, CCD or CMOS imager in one of these devices and then claim that it had twice or three times the resolution that it did. And the way they achieved that is by upscaling the picture in software. It'd be really no different from me taking a low-resolution photo into a paint program and then doubling the resolution of the paint program and resaving it. I didn't add any additional detail to the photo, but it is now a bigger image, right? <laughs> and since 99% of consumers probably didn't know what interpolation was, um, they probably just assumed, like in the case of this, they were getting a 6 megapixel camera. Now, keep in mind, Aptek was by no means the only company that used this deceptive practice, but I will say that I rarely ever saw that practice used by uh, brand name or recognized brand name cameras like Panasonic, Sony, Nikon, things like that. They typically advertised the exact resolution of their sensor. Still, I thought it would be interesting to put this to a scientific test, so I mounted the camera on a tripod and put it in macro mode. According to the specifications in the manual, the optimal distance is 60 centimeters. Then um, I took one of these camera test patterns and taped it to the wall. 
However, the resulting image was kind of blurry, so I decided I'd just have to experiment until I found the optimal focal distance myself. I started by setting the resolution to 1 megapixel and then taking a picture. And then taking a picture in 3 megapixel mode and then eventually in 6 megapixels. And so here we are. Uh, the idea is I want to zoom in and compare pieces of this chart from all three modes. Now these numbers themselves are meaningless for this particular test, but they are good for making relative comparisons. So here I have all three resolutions with 1 megapixel on the left and 6 megapixel on the right. So if you look at this convergence test, you'll see it starts to get blurry around the number 4. And by 5 it's just a big blur. Moving over to the 3 megapixel image, you can see an improvement here. And even by 5 there are distinct lines. However, when we go over to the 6 megapixel image, I can't see any difference at all. Now here's another test. Some people on camera forums back in the day uh, used to argue that you should still use the 6 megapixel mode because even though the resolution is fake, uh, there's less compression noise because a larger file size is allocated. This does appear to be possibly true since I can see less compression noise around the actual numbers themselves like 4, 5, and 6. But uh, there's certainly no extra detail. Okay, so even though the specifications didn't live up to their claims, in fact, I'd go so far as to say that a VHS-based uh, camcorder could probably produce superior results, at least with the video aspect of the device. Despite that, uh, these devices were still pretty cool because they were small enough to fit in your pocket and they were also cheap enough that you could carry them with you wherever you wanted without worrying about them getting broken or stolen. And it was super convenient to be able to record directly to SD cards. As a result, I have a lot of videos and still photos from the time period that I would not have otherwise had. And while many people laughed at me for carrying around what was essentially a kid's toy, uh, complaining about the video quality, the reality is the uh, best camera to use is the one you have with you. And today, that's your smartphone. But 13 years ago, for me at least, it was this device. Now, I often had it with me, so uh, I got a lot of video of my daughter and other family events that I wouldn't have had otherwise, even if the quality isn't super great. One interesting tidbit though, it uh, has a jack that doubles as a headphone jack or a composite video jack. And when connected to an old CRT television, uh, the video quality actually looks surprisingly good uh, since the resolution is lower on the TV and it hides a lot of the artifacts. So for playing back your videos in this manner, it wasn't bad. And uh, I'd say this product is the 21st century equivalent of the Fisher-Price Pixel camera from the 1980s or the Tyco camera from the 1990s that I reviewed a while back. Um, and was actually sold for around the same price as what you'd paid for the Tyco camera back then. So um, this product sort of rides the line between a kid's toy and a real camcorder. Well, I hope you enjoyed seeing this little piece of forgotten technology um, that really wasn't all that long ago in comparison to a lot of the videos that I do. Um, the first nail in the coffin for devices like this was probably around 2007 when a lot of name brand manufacturers like Sony and Panasonic started uh, making memory-based camcorders that used SD cards. And then I think the final nail in the coffin was when all the smartphones started to have a video recording capability. I mean, after all, if everybody already has a video recording device in their pocket, there's not much market for a separate device to do that. Anyway, um, so that about wraps it up. So as always, thanks for watching.